Who here has seen the exhibition? Okay. <laughs> I ask because in the exhibition, in case you don't already know, you will see my avatar, and her name is XOX. And so this is what the, uh, the, the title of this talk is referring to when I say the history of XOX and the future of the three sisters who are also in that show. So I just wanted to tell you, yeah, that's what I'm gonna tell you about. But first I'm gonna just tell you a tiny bit about myself um, because a lot of people from these territories of the, that are like the Haudenosaunee and, and related don't know that our society is, is organized in this way, which is that an individual, myself, Skawanadi, is born into a clan, if, you know, their mother's clan. And mine is the turtle clan. I'm from Gahnawage, so, and then Gahnawage is one community of the Mohawk Nation, or now we're calling ourselves again, oh my God, there's a spelling mistake. Everyone look at the, my mis the spelling mistake. <laughs> Ganyangehaga. And the Ganyangehaga are, are one of six nations of the Haudenosaunee, formerly known as the Iroquois. That's like, yeah. Oh, that's not fitting very well, and I hope that doesn't... What do you think about that? <laughs> this, it's, uh, we should have tested this. <laughs> do you think you can help me? Yeah, thanks. So what you're not quite seeing is just Abtech, my, the logo for the research network that I co-direct with Jason Edward Lewis. And uh, oh, I f yeah, sorry, I forgot to say, I want to start by saying thank you <laughs> to Genevieve, who is she here? I can't see her, oh my gosh. Thank you for inviting me here and to Lilia as well. And I wanted to also thank Ambre, who is not here at this moment, but she's been dealing with me and all my issues <laughs> for about a year now. Uh, I, also, uh, I also didn't ask their permission, but I wanted to point out two people from my team like, who work with me and who make, make my visions a reality that I could not do without them. Nancy Townsend in the back is our producer, and Kathleen Deerhouse is my, what are you? You're my confidant, you're my uh, cousin, you're, you are my inspiration, you are my inspiration. Anyway, she helps me make all kinds of things and she actually made the wampum belt that's in the show. Um, okay, so that's Abtech and uh, all right. So now this fits, that's good. I'm gonna go back in time a tiny bit, rewind. Yeah, so it's a little cut off, not my artwork, but I'm starting with Barbie because I think Barbie is the prototype of the avatar. Um, I, um, I loved my Barbie. I was, grew up in the 70s. All the Barbies were blonde. That was not a problem for me. I still loved her. I loved her because everything, I think, you know, Mattel, the, the company that makes Barbie, they wanted to convey to little girls that, that they could do anything. And that is what I got out of Barbie. I didn't think, I didn't look at her and go, oh, I need to have big boobs like her. Oh my God, my waist doesn't fit. I, I looked at her and I was like, oh yeah, man, I'm in my dad's car. Actually, we're in a spaceship, you know? And I was like, you know, in the garden, our, our, we had a little garden in our backyard. And I was like, Barbie's at the beach, you know? Like it was, for me, it was actually very empowering to have a Barbie doll. And then we'll fast forward to 1995-ish. And um, this is an uh, image of thepalace.com. Anybody here familiar with the palace? No? It was the first graphical chat room on the internet ever. Okay, and so what was a chat? Well, if you knew what a chat room was, most people here would know, you know, back in the day, a chat room is what we do now all the time, but it was like you would open up a little window on your on your PC, and you would talk to people instantaneously around the world, and it was amazing. Well, this one was based on that idea, but now you had the graphical interface. You had the first, this was my first avatar. I mean, not, not one of these, not one of these really, but they were just like a smiley face, you know? And uh, I just, I was in love with this place. I was here visiting this palace online hours a day, for months and months. And I also, um, I loved it, partly, like I just, I love the social aspect of it. And I love the idea of meeting up with people that were um, separated by potentially very vast distances. And so um, I thought that how much 
indigenous people needed something like this, especially indigenous artists. Around that time, sometime in the mid '90s, I had been I had gone to a um, like a conference. It was like actually it was the National Artist Run Center. I can't remember what it used to be called, but remember there was a national association, and I went there, and there was like a few other contemporary indigenous artists, and I'd like. Of course, I had met a couple because there's some from my community, but it was just so astounding how much we had in common, you know, and how much we had to talk about. And I realized, like, we needed a place to talk. And remember back then, like, phone calls, how much they were? Remember we used to call people at long distance only on Sundays because it was, like, two-thirds off? <laughs> like, you know, it just felt like even a phone call seemed difficult and not a real meeting. But to me, you know, being in a room like this felt like a meeting. Now, it took some convincing to convince other indigenous people that that was what we could do, but I did it, and we, um, we had uh, some meetings in CyberPow. And so CyberPow is this, is this seminal, or I don't know if that's the right word, but it's a, it's, a, it's a thing, it's an event and a project that I did that formed a lot of what I have been doing ever since. Uh, and yeah, I, I did a bunch of versions as like the curator with lots of people invited other artists, other co-curators, and I invited people to make work, digital work that could be put in this virtual gallery and to then come all together and meet, look at the work and talk about it. So fast forward a little bit more to around 2004 and somebody shows me Second Life. And what is it? It is, I, I, it is a user-generated 3D virtual community, or also known as a massively multiplayer online world. And I was, I was this is what I was. Wait a second! <laughs> Second Life is my, you know, my loves, my Barbie and the palace put together. And you know, I always, like, Kathleen's heard this so many times, but like, you know, the only thing I didn't like about Barbie is she couldn't stand on her own. You know, and here in Second Life, not only could Barbie stand, you know, because she, you know, they do kind of look like Barbies a little bit, the, all the avatars in there, you know, but she could walk, run, and fly. She can teleport, she can send messages to other avatars, and best of all for me, like the palace, highly customizable. And so you could take this avatar and put different hair on her, change her skin color, Took a while for the darker skin colors to show up, but they were there and they were made, and now there's all the colors. Um, you know, do a lot of changes. And one question I'm always asked, so I'm just going to put it out there right now, is like actually a little hard to change. It used to be pretty hard to change the body shape. Okay, you could you could do a few things, but it was pretty much the Barbie shape, like a little bigger or a little smaller, taller or shorter. So. The other thing someone told me about Second Life is, and you can make movies in there. And I was like, what? And so I did. I, and oh my God, though, it was not easy. <laughs> it wasn't, there was like no manual or little help, <laughs> help menu. But it's okay, I figured it out. And I made this movie called Time Traveler TM. It is the story of a Mohawk man who lives in the year 2121. And in that time, they have this technology, this, in fact, it's, it's edutainment um, called Time Traveler TM. You put on these glasses, and then you, can, you see a head-up display inside the glasses, and you can type in a search date or a search term, and you can time travel <laughs> uh, by, by, having, by basically going into a Second Life type environment, a 3D, you know, or the holodeck, kind of like that, and you can enjoy a, a significant moment from history. So what this character does, Hunter's the one wearing the glasses in the background, is he decides, he knows he's Mohawk, but he doesn't really know a lot about his own culture or history. And he sort of doesn't feel like, it doesn't, he feels too shy to go to Gahanawagi, because he lives in Montreal. But you know, he doesn't want to go to Gahanawagi, which is, I'm feeling like I'm in Montreal right now, but I forgot, I'm in Quebec City. But so in Montreal, Gahanawagi is very close by. It's like a, it's, you know, on trip, it's like 30 minutes with traffic to get from downtown Montreal to Gunawage. Anyway, he doesn't want to go, but you know, he feels very comfortable punching in Mohawk 
and seeing what comes up or in, you know different keywords. And so he ends up um, he ends up learning a lot about indigenous history. He ends up going because he's like. A guy. <laughs> He's like this kind of guy. He he wanted to you know be involved in in fights and battles. So he that's what he looks up. Of course he checks out the Oka crisis. Then he meets a woman from our time, a mother Mohawk, and they fall in love. And she through a glitch in the system gets a pair of the time traveler. TM glasses. And her glasses are very special indeed because they allow her to actually travel in time. So everyone else wearing the glasses is not, but she can for some reason. It's never explained and I never will explain it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they fall in love and the, you know, spoiler alert, she chooses the future. And that's like, there's a lot of messages in Time Traveler TM. You can watch all the episodes. There's nine episodes. It lasts 75 minutes in all. And they're all online on my site, skawanadi.com. And um, she, the message, though, the ultimate message is like, yeah, we belong in the future. And we're going to choose the future. And we're going we're gonna to go there as Native people. Because, sorry, one thing I didn't say that I think is obvious, but maybe not, you know, you probably all know this. We are always shown in the past. We're, and you know, it still seems like we can find people who are surprised that we even exist. Um, and so, you know, I'm like saying, yes, we exist, duh, you know, but, uh, and we're surviving, but actually we're not, we're not even satisfied with survival. We're gonna thrive. So I also, what I try to do in all my movies, but it's really, this one is, that's another clear thing is, is he goes from being, in a really bad place, he like he lives alone in a storage locker. You know, he doesn't can't find a job, so he's sort of like, you know, unsuccessful, let's say. And then he goes to being rich and famous and in love with another person who loves him back. And so that's these are the what I decided for this, you know, these short movies to be the terms of success and thrivance. My next movie is a little shorter, <laughs> it's 20 minutes long, and it's called She Falls for Ages. And uh, it is a sci-fi retelling of the Haudenosaunee creation story. And for those of you who don't know, don't feel bad. It's, <laughs> it's not taught at school. Um, in our cre The creation story has many versions, but um, mostly, and I'm going to tell you like the basic version, okay? Like that has, you know, the basic, what's, what seems to be common to all of them is there is a woman. She lives in a place beyond the heavens or sky world often called. And she is pregnant. And some, somehow a tree, a very special tree called the celestial tree, sometimes it is said that it has many different kinds of fruit. Other times it is said that it has many blossoms that light the world. It is uprooted, and this woman goes through the hole that is created into, into our, our atmosphere, falling into to an earth that is covered in water, and there are uh, animals that help her land safely, and she is able, oh yes, she also usually has something that she has clutched from Sky World. Sometimes it's seeds, often it's seeds, and she's able to plant and create uh, this earth by mixing, uh, mixing you know, the element from Sky World with the earth and the help of the animals. And she, oh, she lands on a turtle's back. I'm not sure if I said that. And that's why people say that this land is Turtle Island. And that's why I think that Turtle Island is not North America, but is Pangaea, the super, original supercontinent, and that it's, this story is for all people and not just North Americans. Okay. That's her house. <laughs> um, I guess one of the things that I sh would like to tell you too that I get to do in Second Life is world building. It's like create, you know, um, Kathleen was there when this happened too, but this, you know, there's this artist who invited me to come and talk, um, come and talk in his class. And afterwards, and I had only made time travel at this time, so this was years ago. 
And you know, in Steen Time Traveler, I'm, I end up, I want this guy to be in the future, but I keep representing the past. I keep like, I'm making a church from the past. I'm making like the barricades, you know, I'm just recreating the past. And so he says to me, you know, it's going to be really great when you do your own thing. And I was, I was so mad at him because I was like, I am doing my own thing. Like, what do you think I'm talking? What do you think I'm doing? But then when I made She Falls for Ages, I really did do my own thing. You know, I chose like, I chose the pink sky. I, cho I wanted them to all be wearing white and I, I wanted them to have different colored skin and that the clothing, you know, showed their skin. So I made lots of circle, lots of holes in the clothing, you know. And, uh, and yes, I, I was like, oh, now I know what he was talking about. <laughs> and I really, did, I really did want to show a future. And so in my version of the, of the Haudenosaunee creation story, Sky World is another planet. I should say that all the versions I'd ever seen or heard t still took place, like, even though it was Sky World, it looked just like Earth. They lived in long houses just like our ancestors did. Like they, it totally just looked the same as Earth. And I was like, that's a lost opportunity. You know, <laughs> like this could be a whole other planet. And so that's what I did do. I made them aliens. And um, the other big thing I, I did is I usually, when the woman falls, it's for two poor reasons. One is that she was very clumsy and she like just fell through this gaping hole. And then the other one is that um, her husband pushes her. And I was like, that is not the Mohawk women I know. You know, this is a matrilineal society with tough women, like women who have a lot of power and agency. I think she is gonna choose to jump through that hole. She's gonna be an astronaut. She's gonna be an explorer. She's gonna go into the unknown and with her unborn child to start a new world. And so that's, that's my version. Also online at skawanai.com if you would like to see it. I will take a sip of water. I'm finally gonna show you a little bit of movement in a second. <laughs> um, the Peacemaker Returns. is another 20-minute mishinima that is a sci-fi retelling of the Haudenosaunee Confederation story. So this is the story of how those originally five and now six nations came together when they actually hated each other's guts for as long as they could remember and would, were at war. Uh, and I um, was commissioned to make this piece by Vox Centre d'image uh, Contemporain in Montreal. And they asked me very specifically for something. Some of you are nodding, so you might know this already. But Vox does this um, children, a show for children, an exhibition that's created for children. And so they, um, so of course they asked me. It's <laughs> like so everyone thinks my work is for children, but there's swearing in it. Damn it, <laughs> nakedness. Anyway, I, I was very happy to do that. They they actually asked me. They were very interested in the Quebec elementary school social studies program and in responding to it. And I was, I actually was the right person to ask at that time because my kids had just gone through that elementary school, you know, had were at that right age. And I remember reading their social studies book and seeing that Jacques Cartier was the first person to set foot on the, in the St. Lawrence Valley. And I was like, is this for real? Like, I couldn't believe it. So um, I was very happy to respond to that uh, with this story. And um, I think I'm gonna show you another slide and then I'll show you my two minute trailer, like, you know, but it's a 20 minute movie. And um, a, a story, a funny story in my opinion, <laughs> is that I was making this, this um, movie, you know, and Nancy's like telling me, Okay, we've never like even time travel to TM does not have as many scenes and sets and assets as this movie does. Like you know, and I'm like, I think we should really make a scene with RCMP officers stealing babies. And she's like, No, we're done. You know, too much. You know, so I have this meeting with the people at Vox, and I'm showing them the work, and I'm telling them, I'm telling them, you know, where it's at, and they're like, This is really wonderful, um, but we're expecting a whole exhibition 
not just a movie. And I was like, oh my God, like I can't even handle it, you know? So, so they're like, okay, well, what if we think about somewhere where the people could watch the movie? And I was like, ding. I mean, in one second, this, not as beautiful as that, but the longhouse that lit up flash into my mind and you know I draw like it, in my memory it's a napkin <laughs> and I draw this like little sketch and I was like this and they made this beautiful structure that I think is so gorgeous and I'm so proud of even though I didn't all I did was the stupid sketch <laughs> and so when the kids came in they they would have these little cushions and they would sit in the longhouse and um, there's a scene you're going to see that this is actually half a longhouse, and the other half is in the is in the video. So they, I hope, feel a little bit connected. And I also made uh, a bunch of wampum belts, which I did not put in this. I think I left. I moved the picture to the end for some reason, but that was another little part of it. And I recreated some wampum belts that you're going to see in the trailer, which I'm now going to show you. It takes about two minutes. We also didn't check the sound. I hope it works. <laughs> Can people hear? Until recently, life on Earth has been very good. The goal of our mission is to create a union. I have been invited on this historic voyage because I have a special power. I'm a dreamer. I see the past perfectly. So with Peacemaker Returns, I was really thinking about kind of like, why do I want to be Native? Like, why do Indigenous people continue to resist assimilation, genocide, you know, all that bad stuff? And um, I mean, I know why I want to be, I want to be Mohawk and, and identify as Mohawk, but I, I felt like I needed to have better reasons. <laughs> And so, like, you know, I think, um, so when I looked at the story, the, the, origin, the creation story, you know, I, I saw, I saw the, I can feel the reasons. I, I couldn't still articulate it, and I'm still not doing that great a job. But when I saw, when I thought about the peacemaker, I learned that the peacemaker was able to bring peace, you know, through consensus and through teachings. And I thought, wow, like, can we use those teachings today to bring peace to the planet? And could we perhaps even use that, those same tools in the far future and bring peace to alien nations? And so that's exactly what I, I'm talking about in The Peacemaker Returns. We, I imagine how it could look. It's a little bit silly. It's for kids, but it's also not too bad for adults, you know? And I, I think it's... Um, one of the fun things about doing sci-fi is that you get to skip over some of the tough parts <laughs> and you get to just get to the part of imagining the peaceful or you know the world you want and so that's what I I'm trying to achieve in this uh, movie 
Okay. That was some background to get you to where I'm, I'm at now, but except for there's still a little more background because I promised you some of XOX's history, and that's, that's who this is, who is behind the camera in these movies that you've been watching. It's really me, but I have to, I can only enter the cyber, only enter cyberspace with XOX. So I, I feel that avatars, and this is what she looks like, she's so cool, I love her. And she, you know, I think avatars are extensions of ourselves that allow us to interact in cyberspace. I mean, it's pretty simple, but it's quite powerful, you know. Um, they are not, so I'm saying that because I don't think they replace me. I don't think, like, I don't want to be my avatar, you know. I, I think that she's just like an extension of me, like kind of like, you, you know, your car, your house is in the Marshall McLuhan sense of the word. So... I didn't always, or see, but still I have trouble with pronouns. <laughs> she didn't always look this good. Um, this is my, uh, this is not even my original outfit, but this is when I finally decided to start dressing like uh, I wanted to show that I was Mohawk in Second Life, and I was questioning, like, how does one do that? How do you, you know, how can you show that? What are the signifiers of indigeneity? And so I, I made this ribbon shirt, and, um, well, someone else made it for me. Not Nancy, maybe, but someone in the team. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, I don't know what you're seeing here, but I will tell you that at that time, clothing in Second Life was actually just another layer of skin that was textured with, like, you know, you could paint on it with, like, Photoshop or, you know, or what I did here. And so we put these ribbons on it, but the ribbons were, like, on, stuck on the body, you know. Later on, things, things get better. But uh, anyway, I just, I don't know if that's something. Yeah, so I started to, I did, though, even though I'm saying that, you know, you are not your avatar, I definitely started to have this great desire to dress like her and like to, to, to dress like my avatar one time. And so this is me attempting to do that. And I feel failing. <laughs> um, I made the shirt and like, I went, you know, found this skirt and found these clothes. And I'm like, you know, I tried to find a hairdresser. I was doing a, a talk and I decided to dress up for the talk and, you know, but my talk was eight 30 in the morning and no hairdresser would open to like fix, make my hair look at least like you know, this is not that difficult a thing to do, but for me it is, but I thought for a hairdresser. Anyhow, that's, that happened. So, so that, you know, I think be, part of being an artist is being willing to fail in public like that. <laughs> so a few years later, this young woman comes into our lab. And when I'm saying our lab, that's what I'm, Abtech is like, uh, has, has a lab at Concordia University. I didn't say all that at the beginning like I meant to. I'm sorry. But I get, I'm very lucky because I have access to amazing students who help me with my work. This new young woman walks in. Magali Coulomb was her name. And she already had a degree in fashion design. And I was like, oh, my God, I think you can help me. You know, my avid, like, I, may, I tried to dress as my avatar. Look at this picture. It was so lame. You know, what can we, how can it be, like, better? And she was like, oh, yeah, you just, you need, like, you need more. And so she designed this for my avatar. And I was like, yes. And then so she, oh, that's when I got my new hair. You saw that already. And then she made the pattern. And. Another thing I wanted to do is design the calico. So, so calico is a pattern on fabric that is usually small flowers, okay? And uh, and like it's been a, like it's is very old, like meaning people calico has been produced for hundreds of years at this point, and it was some of the, some of the original fabric that came here, like maybe not the original original, but like just really early. And we make our ribbon shirts out of, with calico, generally speaking. And I wanted to know, like, well, when, you know, how much can I push the ribbon shirt, you know, and it still be a ribbon shirt? When do you stop recognizing it as indigenous clothing? Or, you know, or, or will you? Like, can I grow the cal calico? Like, that was my one, that was one of my interventions. So this is also where we, I actually, you know, tried making the calico look a little bit different on here. And here's me trying to get that cool hairdo and failing. <laughs> but this one wasn't in public, actually. But this wonderful hairdresser was willing to try. We tried all kinds of things. And in the end, uh, it just would never stay still. It would just, like, fall. So I knew, because by this point now, I know that I'm making a photograph uh, of myself and a machinimograph of my avatar. And this is what ended up coming out. 
she says to me, the hairdresser says, go and find a hairstyle for your avatar that I can make. <laughs> so I like found a whole bunch of, and sent it to her. She's like, this is the one, you know? So, and I had long hair at the time. So she, she was able to do that. And so I call this dancing with myself. It's actually a diptych here. It kind of looks like it's one image, but it's two, two separate images. And, you know, what I think about this piece is not that I'm trying to be my avatar, but that we are trying to reach, we are trying to kind of be one, an, one another. So, yes, there's some things about my avatar that I am jealous of, like her fabulous figure, but also the fact that she never has cramps, she never vomits, she's never sick, never has a zit, never hungry, you know, and so sometimes I'm like, oh, that would be so nice. But, of course, I also think... I think my avatar would perhaps like some of the things I get to do, like hang out with you, you know, or have sex, you know, like real sex, <laughs> not avatar sex. <laughs> so um, it's the, it, it's an iter, what's happening is like I've iterated the design of both, both of our clothing, hair, pose, everything, until we could get as close as possible to one another. Back to Barbie. So um, I really do like Barbie, and I now collect Barbie. As an adult, I started collecting. I have a Dolls of Color uh, collection. Um, but I always, you know, and I, I also curated a show about Barbie, and I've read a lot about her. And one of the things that they always say in the books is that she's the first adult doll. Like, like not sex doll, but adult-shaped. You know, most dolls before that were always babies. And I, I thought, you know, I... I've seen these cornhus dolls all my life. Like, they're adult shaped. Like, you know, no one mentions them, of course. So I was thinking, like, there's a connection, there's a connection. And I wanted to show this connection somehow, but I could never think of the way until I made Dancing with Myself. And then I was like, aha, they're all, you know, dolls. They're all playthings. This is my ancestor's toy. This was my toy. And this is my, well, it's actually my toy, but you know, is my, <laughs> my descendant's toy. And so I made, um, I made, again, Kathleen helped me make this Cornhus doll. And I made the outfits for the two dolls. And then um, I took their pictures. And this is the machinima graph. But, um, you know, I had made these two dolls. I mean, these two, the Cornhus doll, whoops, might be on a timer. The Cornhus doll and the Barbie doll were in real life. And so I'm telling, this is a show at Obero, and I'm telling Claudine Hubert, who you probably have you know, you know, she was the director there. I'm telling her that it's just going to be photographs. And she's like, but you have the Cornhus doll and you have the Barbie doll. And I'm, I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm like, but I, I don't have you know, my avatar. <laughs> like, there's no avatar, physical avatar. And she's like, can't you just press, press, you know, control P and print it? <laughs> like, it does not work like that. Never say that again. But she convinced me. I, I mean, I did know how to do it. It just took resources. And so, and I think Nancy was totally for it. Yes. Nancy has a lot to say. And so we found a 3D modeler who could copy my avatar in a 3D modeling program, not Second Life, a different program. And, uh, and really, that's all it took. I mean, it took a while, but it was, we, we were able to do it. The shirt was made. We, we had, like, assets we had made in Second Life that we could kind of import into the 3D model program, Blender. And so we have this as well. And then I also want to show you that XOX also um, has this, this image I have. It's a homage to this image by Mariko Mori called Birth of a Star. This was made in 1996, uh, right when Photoshop was becoming popular. And what I loved, there's some, there's, I love this image, but what I, I, I sort of had this moment of realization that I felt I was doing something very similar to Mariko Mori. Like at that time, she was talking about Japanese culture in a digital world, or, you know, in the future, which I'm conflating a bit here. And these balls could not have been floating without Photoshop. And so I thought, wow, I'm doing the same thing but in Second Life. I, I'm asking myself, how can the indigenous culture be represented here? You know, and it is, it is, absolutely, it is one of the easiest things in the world to make three bo like balls like that in, in Second Life. It's just like cl click, build, click sphere, place it in the world, choose the color. 
And <laughs> that was it. And I was like, oh my God, I got I to gotta make this. And I was trying to decide if I should wear like the same outfit she's wearing or if I should wear my like signature outfit. And so obviously I, I ended up going, that's, this is what it was about. So I, I had to put it in my outfit. All right. And then just for funsies, but how am I doing on time, anybody? Because I've lost track. I didn't put my timer on. It's already 6.20? Okay. Okay. Um, she does wear other things sometimes. This is the Abtec, you know, suit, which, uh, yeah. Anyway. I, okay. Oh, yes. And then finally, all right. So I also, I'm currently making a new project, and I have two parts of it ready to show. It's called Words Before All Else, and it's, it's still, it's like the same thing. It's like this, um, you know, ancient tradition from the Haudenosaunee, which is to give thanks to the cosmos, from Mother Earth to up, uh, to all the things in between, up into the sky, things in the sky world. And um, so it's, it's done in verses, right? And we say the same thing, but we just, you know, we change the thing we're thanking. You'll, you'll see in a second what I mean. What I was asking myself, so again, I believe the Thanksgiving address is not just for us. I believe it's, it would be a fantastic thing for all of us to do is to give thanks, remember where, where our place in the cosmos and why we, should, why we should be thankful for it and how, what the interrelatedness of it all is. But um, I thought, well, what if you give thanks in an unnatural world like cyberspace? What does that mean? What, how can an avatar give thanks? And what would it mean? And so that's what I'm doing right now. And um, this is the first, these are the second and third verse of the thing. And I'll just play it for you. It's only two minutes long. Aguego Oska, andere wat wenuni, ne unqua nigura, den odeo tine waradu, ne yunki nistaha, zi yuhu zade. To gadi nayodu ne unko nigura. Nous rassemblons nos esprits comme un pour saluer et remercier notre mère, la terre. Maintenant, nos esprits ne font qu'un. We gather our minds together as one and greet and thank our mother, the earth. Now our minds are one. Aguego Oska, andere wat we nuni, ne unko ni cura, dan o deu tine waradu, ne gane garunyu. To gazi nayodo ne unko ni cura. Nu rassemblo nos esprits comme un pour saluer et remercier les eaux. Maintenant, nos esprits ne font qu'un. We gather our minds together as one as we greet and thank the waters. Now our minds are one. still images too. So, you all met the three sisters in there, and I'm, I'm testing out another name for them. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> I'm testing out another name for the three sisters, the edgy veggies. Not getting a reaction here, not too much reaction, a little bit there, okay. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> too corny. <laughs> That's a joke. Okay, so, um, so I was doing this project. I was thinking, of, I was doing words before all else. And I was thinking about, how, because, so sorry, back up. Another name for the three sisters is our sustenance. And in the Thanksgiving address, that's one of the verses, we give thanks to our sustenance. Oh, by the way, that version that I'm, I'm saying in, in the 
machinima is like the shortest possible version because mostly people say that sentence and then they explain it and they say you know i give i'm thankful for we're thankful for the fruit and the strawberry is the leader of the fruits and you know this and that and you know there's like a lot of you it can be very embellished and it's i think that's encouraged but i i was anyway getting off topic a little bit sorry sustenance okay how do i depict our sustenance and I was going to do the same old thing that everyone else seems to be doing is showing them like in a ribbon dress or showing them, you know, in, in traditional clothing. And I was like thinking a lot about them and thinking about how amazing they are and how eternal they are and how long they've been around and, you know, how they have sustained the people through tough times. And I was like, they're actually superheroes. I think I should depict them as superheroes. And so um, this is like the very first sketch of them as superheroes. And I've been playing with versions of this ever since. And so I'm just going to go very quickly through them. So here's my you know, favorite Calico again version. This is on one, clearly one single avatar. Here's the ribbon shirt version of the, of the superhero suit. Uh, tried, you know, you might notice these patterns, they were in uh, the drapery that's in the portraits over there. But here I was thinking they could be used here just just showing you the different things we've played with and then you know i wasn't happy with these and i'm still not happy with the final design i'm we're, we're still working on it but i said okay why don't we switch switch uh tasks pivot as the new word is and work on on their bodies so this was like two years ago and at the time still the bodies had the same issue, like we can't really change them very much. And I said, you know, I've never really worried about that, but for these three, I would really like them to have different body shapes. I would really like squash to be voluptuous. I would really like beans to be tall and thin, you know? And so what we figured out was that actually we could change her body, the body suits. We could create these in a 3D program and import them into Second Life, and then they would appear to have different bodies by masking their real bodies with an alpha, for those of you who know what that is. Anyway, so we did that, and we were very happy, but like then the pandemic happened, and, and lots of things happened, and I didn't return to this project until, until recently again. Uh, oh, sorry. And so I tried them on the girls and we, we, we were so happy. It really it seemed to work. I did play with more ideas about them. Uh, these little symbols, which are also present in the portraits that you see, um, I learned about, like they're very, the one in the yellow and the one in the green uh, are really popular in Iroquois bead work. And I was watching a talk by a seed keeper who happens to also be my cousin, our cousin, Stephen Deer, Stephen Deer. Stephen McCumber, and he explained in this talk that this was clearly the bean sprout and this was clearly the corn sprout. And I was like, oh my God. And then of course I had to ask him, well, what does the squash sprout look like? So he drew a little picture for me and that's what I put on them as their, as their things, as their emblems. And then here it is just a little bigger. Again, like I said, I'm just trying things. This is just a crappy Photoshop sketch. Um, and then... Second Life started to come out with bodies. I'm using the simple term because <laughs> like, there's like all these terms. But, uh, and it, so now, so basically, there were still some problems with those outfits. Like they wouldn't necessarily move in the way that we needed the avatars to move. And so we decided that we needed to go choose the future. <laughs> of Second Life and go with these new bodies and learn how to use them because there, there's a learning curve with everything we do in Second Life. But we have these like pretty, you know, different bodies than we could get before that I think have the same attributes, the voluptuousness, the skinniness that we wanted. And then just, you know, this is what I'm kind of more going for. Like I want, I want it to look more like this, you know? So I, I don't know how to do that. And part of why I put it out there is so if you all, all, anyone knows a costume designer that specializes in superhero costumes, can I can meet them? <laughs> and of course, yeah. Uh, and this is one from, I saw in Second Life. That was the only thing. I was like, this is pretty good. And that's my whole presentation. Yawagoa for listening and having your wonderful attention.
I'm sorry. There's time for questions, I think. Like, I was assuming you would, if you had questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah? <laughs> And if you don't, that's okay too. <laughs> the, the long pads that you did at Vox, that was, I, I saw that somewhere else too. Where was it? It's, a, it's, it's been purchased by the National Gallery of Canada. That's where I saw it. I I'm very proud National to say, Gallery. yeah. There was lots of kids there and they were like mm. super into it. Yeah, it was really amazing. Yeah, I love it so much too, yeah. It also traveled around Canada and one stop in the States too. Um, yep. Vox traveled. It. Vox was amazing to work with. I cannot say enough good things about them. Yeah, they did a good job. Merci, Merci. 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 Merci.